Hello, 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 and welcome to the Loudcast with me, your host, Kevin McLean. I am still here, still in my flat and leaf, and still bringing you some of the very best of spoken word. We are back for another episode of the Loudcast. If you didn't check out the last one, we were chatting to Kat Hepburn, one half of Sonic Youth and an amazing writer and performer. Go and check that out. Have a look. Kat is dynamite and Sonic Youth have some awesome stuff coming up. Uh, but we are back with a new episode. Uh, and this time we are going to be chatting to the wonderful Courtney Stoddart a bit later on. She is uh, new to the scene. She's only been around a couple of years kind of performing in uh, the Scottish spoken word scene, but she has blown the scene away and I am so excited to talk to her about all the stuff she has been up to. But before we dive into that, I thought I would set the mood a little and Courtney is, you know, known to write some pretty political pieces and I thought I would dive in with one of our favourite political poets, someone I have brought up endlessly on this show and so I thought it was about time we threw in a poem from her. This is Jess Green with We must be careful not to do to Jeremy Corbyn what we did to Barack Obama and put him on a pedestal from which he can only be a disappointment. So I'm going to finish on this poem and we're going to have some music with it as well from Jack, which is going to be lovely. Cool. So this is called um, We must be careful not to do to Jeremy Corbyn what we did to Barack Obama and put him on a hero worship pedestal from which he can only be a disappointment. And neither of us knows who's going to start first. <laughs> I'll start first. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn will fix my bike. Jeremy Corbyn will ease my backache. Jeremy Corbyn will sort out my noisy neighbours. Jeremy Corbyn will remember my birthday. Jeremy Corbyn will buy me vouchers for a spa weekend. Jeremy Corbyn will ban anti-aging cream adverts and the ones where women eat yoghurt in their pants. Jeremy Corbyn will raise income tax, but only for my ex-boyfriends, and then he will spend it on setting up a dog-friendly poetry night in the East Midlands. Jeremy Corbyn will adequately fund the arts. Jeremy Corbyn will adequately fund education. Jeremy Corbyn will adequately fund the NHS. Jeremy Corbyn will sew up all of the moth holes in my favourite t-shirts. Jeremy Corbyn will chase up those unpaid invoices. Jeremy Corbyn will remind me to go to bed at 10. Jeremy Corbyn will suggest that I don't have that last glass of reds. Jeremy Corbyn will stop me getting anxious on Sunday nights or any other time. Jeremy Corbyn will make the people at BBC Writers Room pick up my scripts. Jeremy Corbyn will stop men who work as accountants offering me constructive criticism at gigs. Jeremy Corbyn will do that for love. Jeremy Corbyn will create emerging artist programmes or at some point the artists actually emerge. Jeremy Corbyn will renationalise the railways. Jeremy Corbyn will spray my suede shoes before I wear them impatiently in the rain. Jeremy Corbyn will give me away at my wedding and then lead the speeches, the first dance and the cutting of the cake. Jeremy Corbyn will marry me. Jeremy Corbyn will finance my one-woman Edinburgh show portraying the life of my blind, three-legged toy poodle then attend every performance and give it five stars in The Scotsman. Jeremy Corbyn will make Leonard Cohen immortal. Jeremy Corbyn will make Bruce Springsteen immortal. Jeremy Corbyn will make Bob Dylan immortal and as good as he used to be. Jeremy Corbyn will successfully run a training event without the need of an interactive icebreaker. Jeremy Corbyn will take me on a cycling holiday around Croatia and we will ride in tandem. Jeremy Corbyn will follow me on Twitter. Jeremy Corbyn will read this poem. Jeremy Corbyn will tell me that he likes it. Cool. Thank you very much. 
That was Jess Green there with a poem title I'm not going to attempt to repeat. <laughs> Beautiful stuff from Jess. Obviously, uh, when we are recording this, we're just about to have Scottish elections. Uh, you will have already had them by the time you see this. I hope you all did the right thing. Come on. Uh, but yeah, that was Jess. Um, and I'm excited to chat to Courtney about her kind of political poetry. Very different um, kind of stylistically to Jess. But yeah, it's an interesting comparison to make. Um, in the last couple of weeks, I was privileged enough to go and check out a Boomerang gig online. They were doing Zoomerang and we love all the folk at Boomerang. We have had uh, PJ and uh, Tyrone both on the show at, at different points chatting to them. And so I went along and checked it out. Katie Ailes was gigging there and one of the features was the absolutely amazing Casey Bailey. I was so pleased to see him again. It has been a while since we had him in at Loud Poets, obviously, but I uh, never, never failed to be overjoyed to see Casey's work and it was no different as Zoomerang. If you haven't checked out Boomerang before, go and check them out. I'm sure they'll be putting on more gigs either online or when they return to their normal London routine. Uh, so yeah, go and check them out. Go and check Casey Bailey out. But for now, enjoy Wax. He told me he would fly to the sun one day. Told me he would push from these gritty streets, these shitty streets. He would push and fly. Higher than the rockets that NASA sent. He told me he would fly to the sun. I told him that's what Icarus said. Brave boy with feathered wings held together with wax. Brave boy with bigger dreams than he'd ever seen. I told him that's what Icarus said. But he told me he would fly to the sun. He would fly higher than Thames Tower, Seven Tower and Medway Tower. He would fly higher than those tower blocks stacked one on top of the other. And even if the crackheads tried to stop him, and the police who raid the flats of the crackheads tried to stop him, he would make it. I can't help but smile at the way he holds the police and the crackheads with the same level of disdain. And I know he hates the police more. I know he's more scared of becoming the crackheads, but he told me he would fly to the sun. I told him that's what Icarus said. Brave boy with feathered wings held together with wax. Brave boy ready to defy all advice he was given. I told him that's what Icarus said. And he looked me in my eyes. Surprised that I gave him so little credit. He said, fam. What kind of idiot holds their dreams together with wax when their dreams involve the sun? <laughs> I listen and I laugh. We laugh. I laugh because everybody I know would tell me that he doesn't get it and he would tell everybody I know that they don't get it and I'm starting to think maybe Icarus just didn't get it. This brave boy with dreams held together with hope, desperate to escape a labyrinth of his father's creation, desperate but determined to push, to rise, to fly. I have never seen someone stuck so long in a nightmare and hold so strong onto their dreams. And for a second, if we've been really honest, loud poets, probably about half a second, I believed him. Thank you. That was Wax from Casey Bailey. What an amazing piece. It was such a privilege having Casey on the Loud Poets stage. Oh, guys, I really want to get back to gigs. I want to book cool poets and put on shows and have a pint. It would be so nice. But in the meantime, we are going to keep going with our, our virtual hangout here on the Loudcast. And obviously, we have just wrapped uh, NapoRimo, National Poetry Writing Month, and the final video release was a univocal, and I thought it'd be a good way to kind of chat to Courtney Stoddart, who's, who's got some experience in univocal vocalism in her own right uh, so I thought I would share this with you guys it's one from me again apologies it's a univocal in I is this it is this living this drifting slight shifting slipping tick Is this my limit? My lid? King shit sitting with glib grin Missing my wrist sling Dripping Spilling Mind swirling In pint swilling spliff mist Thick stink Thin skin Finding 
sticks still sting. Limiting light, snipping strings, stitching sins in skin, signs singing, spirit within is sick. Grimly flirting with infinity. Wits wilting, wills sinking. Still, it grips tight. Fights, fists twitch. Sight whirling, limbs stirring. I'm lying, crying, shirt sticking, clinging slick with skin till thing. Still, thirsty lips, drink, sipping swiftly, finding my rhythm, rising dizzily, stiff, thinking timidly. This isn't it. And that was me uh, with a univocal in I. Um, it was a lot of fun putting that together. We did it as part of our special Napo Rimo series on the uh, Loud Poets sort of Loudcast channel. If you're if you're following here on the YouTube or on your podcast platform, you'll have seen it. Uh, we were releasing a, a video every week, and so I, I put that together in a very short space of time. I'm pretty chuffed with it, um, and it's a good one to use for this particular show because our guest today was part of our. Return to Form series, which all the forms we used for Naparimo were part of. We got 10 incredible poets uh, together to all ca- tackle uh, a, a single form. We put two poets with each form. It was a really cool uh, process. We managed to get some beautiful work out of it that you can see on the YouTube channel. Please do go and check out that. And it was funded by the National Lottery through Creative Scotland. So we're very grateful to them for giving us the opportunity to do it. So I thought, yeah, chat and univocal would be a good way to kick things off. And I'm very excited for today's guest. She is a, a kind of new force in the spoken word scene. She burst in in about 2019, I think. It's only been a, a couple of years. I remember seeing her at BBC Words First and was absolutely blown away. So I am very keen to chat to her about her views on the spoken word scene, how she got involved and all the uh, incredible work she's been doing, both with like national theatre and uh, kind of her, her own work. She has a pamphlet coming up and, and everything like that. It's going to be very cool to talk to her. So please welcome to the Loudcast, Courtney Stoddart. How's it going, Courtney? It's going well. Thank you so much for having me. No, it's very cool. Thanks thanks for coming on and chatting uh, poems with me. I always appreciate it when people are willing to sacrifice an hour for that endeavour. Yeah, no problem at all. No problem at all. Cool, cool. And um, so, like I said in the kind of intro there, uh, you were part of our Return to Form series. And before we dive into uh, stuff, I just kind of wanted to get your opinion on it because we asked a lot of people for feedback and I thought your feedback was kind of the most in sync with my own of like, this was fun, but I would like to write free form, please. Uh, so what, what's your kind of vibe about the Univocal having tackled it? Yeah, it was interesting. Like, I feel like once I got into the flow of it, it was fine. Um, but just it was kind of the initial uh, trying to work out like how on earth do I do this <laughs> was just sort of yeah I was a, a little bit lost with it for a while um, but I think kind of just trying to find words that sound alike seemed to work for me like and then you know kind of just writing just almost trying to free write it and then going okay that word has not got a, a, you know it's got too many vowels in it just cross that out and you know in that kind of way rather than um yeah kind of overthinking it too much which is what I was doing at the start so <laughs> it's I, I feel your pain like it's because obviously I, I've listened to a bunch of your work and there is a huge amount of rhyme and sort of rhythm and flow to the things you do and I was very impressed when uh you know you kind of submitted your your poem for return to form of how much you managed to maintain that I didn't realize how difficult it was until I tried to do it myself and then I was doubly impressed <laughs> So like was was that was that the big was that the big hurdle trying to keep that sort of rhythm and flow? Um yeah, I mean I think that's just so ingrained in me that I think I think it would have been harder for me not to do that if you know what I mean like cuz that that's just so ingrained in how I write. Um so I I just kind of have to just yeah, just kind of 
do what I already do, but adapt it kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah. Does that make any sense? That's, that's how I feel like I've managed to tackle it. <laughs> I've always kind of said, because like, I, I hated, uh, I keep saying this on my poetry podcast, I probably shouldn't, but I hated poetry at high school. Uh, like I never, I never kind of wrote or anything. So when I found poetry later on and started trying to write, I could only do by like, by ear, by like what I liked the sound of. Uh, I, you know, didn't understand anything about form or anything like that. How did you kind of get into writing poetry? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm exactly the same. Like I didn't write at, at school at all. I, I, I had no um, kind of understanding of poetry. I didn't, yeah, I had no affinity for it whatsoever <laughs> and no affinity for school either. So um, <laughs> yeah, all the kind of poetry we got taught at school, I was like, oh no, like, what is this? And like, we used to have to do like a Burns week at my primary yeah. and like memorize a poem. And it was, I, I used to like beg my mom to stay off school for it. I just, <laughs> I hated it so, so much. Um, so I, I never thought I would ever get into poetry ever. Um, but then I was thinking I was about I was about nineteen and I was just I was just going through a difficult time in my life and I had this this notebook and it I just started writing and then from there I've just never really stopped and I I think it it was it was very much a a sort of therapeutic exercise initially and I I never thought that I would actually um, you know go, go into performing poetry at all it was it was literally just for my own benefit really. Yeah. And um, yeah, and then sort of 2019, uh, my friend um, Shahida Sinclair, who's um, goes by Nova Scotia The Truth, she's like a musical artist. She asked me to perform at her um, one of her album launches because she knew I wrote poetry and stuff. And so I just thought, well, yeah, why not? Kind of thing. I, th I thought I'd be kind of um, inhibiting my own growth in a sense if I didn't just do something different and I and because I'm naturally quite a shy person like I, I don't really like um you know the, the thought of being on stage to me is is prior to having done it would have been my work literally my worst <laughs> nightmare like I couldn't have thought of anything worse and so I just thought you know to kind of grow as a person maybe I really need to to do this tackle this fear kind of thing and then um from there it just kind of um yeah I got a couple more gigs after that and then um did the BBC Words first thing and then it's kind of just just gone on from there really that's that's so fascinating because I I, I would I would have always considered you like a good example is uh the last few guests we've had on the show weirdly like and and and, and myself are all people who kind of came from something performancey right like theater kids or people who were already working in like film or tv and things like that and I see a lot of that of like people who are doing performancey creative outlets stuff and I think poetry then makes sense to them because they can do the whole thing you're your own director writer producer performer right it's like all in one it's fascinating to to see someone like yourself who is such a talented performer you know what I mean that there, there is like a lot of craft to to what you do you know it like and especially you can see that by you being then Kind of picked up and included in theater production you know where it's 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 not necessarily about your writing but your ability to convey the emotion of of the work that that wasn't an an, an intention for you do you think do you think people look at you as like a a, a performance poet because that might be a bit of a misconception then right yeah i mean because people have sort of said that to me and um yeah i mean it was just i it was just never my intention and i, th I think um yeah, I think I'm just quite an emotional person. <laughs> so <laughs> that kind of just comes out, I suppose, when I'm on stage. And I, I don't really, I don't overly think about what I'm doing in that sense. Like, obviously, I've, you know, I would practice my poems and things, but, yeah. you know, I, I don't like overly think about how I'm kind of putting it across. I just kind of, kind of just feel it and just do it kind of thing. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just surprising to me, to anyone, as to <laughs> anyone, you know, how I've ended up. Here, you know, if you'd have told me sort of five years ago that I would be, um, you know, doing sort of theatre plays and stuff, I would have been like, oh no, absolutely not. Like, you know, I would have never, never saw that for myself at all, at all. That's 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 crazy. Yeah, it's it's interesting as well because I think I think when you look at um, freeform writing and you think about um, you know not necessarily coming from a writing background but writing for yourself, that then you're so you know you're you're creating your own style out of that because you're not you know relying on form or meter that is then you know replicated throughout other 
pieces of work. You're having to find your own rhythms and structures to things. And I wonder if that just inherently kind of helps you perform them because you know how they're supposed to sound in your own head when you're writing them type deal. I don't know, does that make any sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, um, you know, I come from a very sort of, um, like, you know, my family, like my you know, my mum, my dad are like massive music fans, like, you know, like almost to like an obsessive point, like they love music. And so I'd, I'd always been, um, I'd always grown up, you know, listening to a lot of like sort of conscious hip hop. And so I think kind of rhyming schemes and stuff were kind of, embedded in my um subconscious just from yeah. listening to so much music and so yeah when I started writing I think that just kind of kind of filtered into it because it's, it's what I'd absorbed sort of thing uh, yeah I think there is there is that thing as well of j just thinking about how then people see you as a poet right of going like they would very much see you in the spoken word vein or performance vein and it, it's it's obviously the uh, researcher for this show who kind of puts together you know notes and stuff and and, and helps kind of put the the show together uh, is katie ailes who's a, a spoken word researcher and we've talked about her her work on this show a bunch about um like perceived authenticity and there's this thing of like people who are of a certain class or approach their poetry like from a like you said like right you know maybe hip-hop influences or the punk poet rant influences or people who are like you know deemed other right black people or people of color or you know women or lgbt people that they are authentic and therefore spoken wordy and performancy like spoken word has become a catch-all for young activisty poetry rather than people who are aiming to deliver their words on the stage is that a thing you've kind of run into of being pigeonholed that way um like sort of being perceived that way or well, expected to be that rather than like you know you're saying right people see you in that that vein i i have always been exposed to your work in a live setting whereas obviously you are working as a as a poet putting stuff on you know you were initially writing for the page like do you think because you are you know a young black woman that then that makes people think you are more likely to be presented in a, a, a performance way rather than a written way yeah i mean i suppose because people yeah people have sort of asked me before but like i think my poetry would sort of work on the page and things like that and, <laughs> you know like i'm just sort of like well you know i hope so i mean i did start on, I, I mean i started on the page so you know i hope that it would translate um in some sense you know and i think yeah the sort of you know I, I never started writing to become like an activist or yeah. anything like that you know um but you know i think you know like i've been i was asked to perform at like the black lives matter protest in edinburgh and you know people have kind of maybe sort of some people so sometimes view me in that in that light you know and that's it's not that i've um kind of set out to do that but i suppose my work kind of um it, it covers a lot of issues in today's society but you know i'm I was primarily writing just to understand that myself and to be yeah. able to, um, you know, process just all that shit within, within my own mind, really. Um, you know, and then it, I suppose, yeah, it kind of, sorry, I don't have a, I'm not sure about actually answering your question. No, no, it's it, absolutely. I think because the thing that gets caught up and it's, it's, it's kind of part of a, a, a recurring conversation we've had on this show, right, of like how people are viewed as certain things of like, okay, you're a, you're a spoken word theater poet okay you're a funny poet you're a you know this or that and you know i've spoken to guys like tyrone lewis or stuff you know pe people who are you know poets of color and like tyrone has expressed that right where it's like that people expect you to have your your black poem or your this poem and stuff rather than viewing you as someone with a, a kind of totality of work that expresses various issues and like i had an interesting conversation with with hannah where she was like well it's easy to see you know pieces of her work and go oh that's about race in scotland or whatever but it's like to her it's a personal story about you know her family or her upbringing and it's like race is inherently a part of that because society but like <laughs> i don't know if it's the aim because I, I think it's you know when you look at your work your work is very um politically charged you know you 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 talk about issues like you you use very um direct language in your poetry which i love like you know you, you use the words that are <laughs> applicable it's it's not so laced in uh, abstract imagery or metaphor uh, so i just wonder if that's then what people expect do you get the chance to you know express other sides of, of what you're writing yeah i mean i suppose because yeah i mean i do i feel like um i mean maybe in my sort of 
the poetry maybe I'm writing more now I think I maybe um play around more with just kind of metaphor and simile and imagery and stuff just because um yeah you just get I think you just get bored of just writing the same <laughs> kind of thing all the time you know and and you, just, you know just as you're learning and and growing as a human being you pick up on other you know things which are going on in the world and you know or books that you read or you know whatever kind of allows you to see things in a different way and I think the poetry that I kind of wrote um and then the stuff which I've more regularly performed is kind of just like right this is what's really pissing me off about the world and you know this is how I feel about it kind of thing and um and I suppose maybe now maybe there's a little bit more nuance just because I'm I'm older now I'm you know I hope a little bit wiser and so you know there's maybe kind of different different elements I suppose um to play around with and I think I'm not as angry as I used to be when I was younger I think I was you know even, even like two years ago you know I think I'm I'm not as I'm not as angry as I as I was so I think um yeah that it all kind of filters in doesn't it to kind of what, what you're writing Oh, absolutely. And I, I, I especially think when, you know, people are writing cathartically, like you're saying, that's how you kind of started out. Obviously, then that's a want to express a certain thing, right? Like, obviously, you know, whether that be issue based or, you know, personally or anything like that, it's it's something that is stuck in your head, you're trying to get out. So it's like, you do have to kind of write through those things to then eventually get to other stuff you want to write. You know, I mean, it's representative of, you know, mental health or whatever, you need to get through the bad patch to be able to see the other stuff that's going on oh definitely yeah yeah 100 percent. so when 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 you started making that transition and kind of getting into like you know you were saying you, you got some gigs and things and then bbc words first came up could you because it's, it's not a thing i think we brought up on the show but it's an amazing opportunity for specifically young spoken word artists right people who are in their first years of writing and and, and developing what was your kind of experience of going through bbc words first oh it was i mean it was amazing yeah like um you know as i said yeah i'd had a few a few gigs um after the um my friend's album launch thing and then uh you know i I think i was just i can't remember how i came across it i think it was it was really random like i wasn't sort of searching for anything like that it was maybe just on like the bbc website or something and i saw it and i was like uh oh okay i was like why not i'll i'll apply for it kind of thing and um you know I was quite surprised when like I never told anybody that any of my friends or anything that I'd applied and um you know I was quite surprised when I got through I was like oh, oh my god kind of thing and then um yeah it, it was really nice because I'd never really met that many other poets kind of thing or young you know I don't because I was only I was literally only in it in the that sort of scene for like you know a couple of months kind of thing yeah because um BBC Words First was in June so yeah I just kind of uh yeah it was, it was nice to just be able to to meet other people who are kind of doing the same thing and hear all their different styles and all that kind of stuff and it was Noiriki who were kind of organizing it uh, like the Edinburgh regional part of it yeah so um yeah that was really good to like meet them and yeah I couldn't believe it when I got when I got through to the to the sort of next part of it I was completely uh shocked and you know i remember just before doing the the sort of final performance thing where they then decide who goes to perform in manchester like you know i'd had like a beer before and i was like oh my god i'm so nervous and all this kind of stuff and um yeah i think all, just all that anxiety and then i just got on the stage and i was just like ah, kind of thing <laughs> just lay it all out kind of thing and then yeah it was, but it was a, a really great experience um in, in so many different ways and, and my first publishing opportunity as well um through uh what are they called own it own it london that's what they're called the publishing company and um, they published like 12 of the poets who got through to the kind of final um sort of stage or whatever and um yeah so it was it was really great all in all nice great time yeah because there's there's like a is there a mentoring element to it because they bring in kind of like more seasoned spoken word artists to run workshops and stuff right is there a what element to it? Is, is there a sort of mentoring element, like the workshop element to it? Is... Yeah, yeah. We had um, we had Hannah Ladry actually as one of the people who came in to do the workshops. We had Jenny Lindsay and we had Colin Maguire. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's that's a real array of of styles. <laughs> yeah. Totally. And you know, I wasn't obviously because I, I, I've, I've never taken an interest in those sort of poetry scenes, so I've no idea kind of who any of these people were at all because I wasn't you know um 
kind of within the scene or whatever and then now I'm like oh right like that's really cool like um so um yeah it was um it was great fun like doing all the workshops and stuff and um yeah it was really good really good I mean that must have been it must have been quite a, a an odd experience of having you know been writing and having that you know a sort of catalogue of work that is only your own to then be kind of thrown into a scene of other people doing it like that you have no exposure to and then yeah. you know put into such a concentrated environment of you know other people who are like oh no this is you know an opportunity to you know hone skills and that and being a bit lost in it did, did you feel a, quite a quick development after that then being kind of exposed to it yeah I mean I felt um I just yeah i just i did feel a little bit thrown in the deep end like i remember the first the first day we they you know the first thing noiviki made us do was like perform kind of you know a poem oh, um yeah. like one of our own poems and i was like oh my god like you know i've maybe had like three three performances in my life before do you know what i mean so i was like you know and everyone i mean maybe they weren't confident i can't you know i can't say one way or the other but they all seemed super confident and obviously that's my projection of my own insecurity as well yeah, yeah, so yeah. they just seemed like extra confident and um yeah just I remember like literally like shake like standing on the stage and like my hands were like shaking like I couldn't even move my hands it was just, like by my side just like oh yeah but I, I feel like I, I definitely learned um so much from the whole from the whole experience I'd obviously got to go to Manchester and um yeah so yeah it was good it's I mean I think things like that are, are so worth doing even just for those those small connections because it's interesting you you bring up like Hannah Lavery there and obviously you and Hannah have, have worked together uh, since um, you did uh, a play for the um, it was National Theatre right National Theatre Scotland yeah uh, the, uh, it was the lament for Sheku Bayo um, how did how did that come out was that of just kind of maintaining a, a, a relationship with Hannah because obviously she she wrote and directed uh, that play yeah um so actually we um we never sort of like connected at, at um at that point like um you know because she was kind of just in doing a workshop yeah. i suppose and then um it was actually after it was maybe oh it would have been that july yeah july so that was june 2019 and then july 2019 i ended up performing at kelburn Festival, oh, nice, nice. Um, which was great. I think Iona Lee usually puts the the poetry yeah, on for that too. She asked yeah. me to do it. Yeah, she asked me to do it. Um, so and I'd been to Kelburn once before, um, a few years before, and then so yeah, it was it was really good to get to go. Um, and obviously not to pay. <laughs> that was definitely a plus. Um, and yeah, so I met I met Hannah there because she was headlining, um, the poets for that that day on the Sunday or whatever and um she came up to me after I would performed and she was like oh I think I might have something you might be interested in like can I take your email um and then I I didn't sort of find out anything for must have been a good couple of weeks kind of thing and then she emailed me being like you know do you want to be in a play and I was like uh, all right like <laughs> you know um <laughs> and I was sort of a bit like oh god like can I do this like because I just yeah just a lack of experience and you know I'd only been performing for maybe like four months at that point and um but I just thought I can't turn down an opportunity like that and obviously because of the subject matter you know I think if I'd been offered a play where I had to like I don't know be a proper like character or do you want to be in Midsummer Night's Dream yeah you know, maybe not <laughs> probably would have turned that down <laughs> um, but you know it was the sort of subject matter is yeah. obviously you know so important and um I just thought like why not kind of thing so and then you know have it's grown from from there we've had we had that run um which was just like a oh, i always forget what it's called a rehearsed reading yeah. um of of it then which was just i think it was like three or four shows and then just last um last november we ended up we got this kind of a, a good run and it was all filmed and everything like that so yeah so how how did you find it then? Because you know uh, you're saying that like your aim in, in poetry, right, is uh, to to sort of share the work you were you were doing anyway, and like that's obviously then understandable to draw you into to being on stage and stuff. Have you have you found more joy in the performing where like that was a less hard transition to be like, oh no, I will enjoy this, or was it something very nerve wracking for you? It was definitely nerve wracking, definitely. Um, but I think I, I think it was really good because I was almost eased into it because we had the rehearsed reading, which was literally just reading from a 
you know, we, we were we were just sitting on stage, there was no movement, and we were just reading from the script. Um, so obviously, you know, you've got to perform with your voice or whatever, but you know, you're yeah. not kind of getting up and doing any dramatic movements or anything. So that kind of gave me the taster of it. And then obviously, when we did it last November, that was obviously a bit more of the kind of movement stuff involved, which I did, I did find challenging, definitely. Yeah. Um, just because I was sort of like oh god like i can't do you know i can't just get up and like walk around this chair like this I can't, you know it was it seems so suddenly very aware of your own hands yeah, it seems yeah. so. you know you just go into this really awkward kind of you know your body just tens tenses up and stuff but i think you know because i knew that it was um you know it's hannah's vision it's her um you know of how she wanted this to be and i want i wanted it to be so right for her for her because mm. you know i could only imagine writing a play and ha watching other people perform it and if they don't do it how you want it i could imagine that'd be really frustrating you know so i really wanted to be able to kind of capture what she wanted and then also just you know to be able to do a good performance just to be able to convey such an important message yeah. aside from anything else you know so um so yeah what it, it was definitely challenging but i learned learned so much throughout the whole the whole thing because one of the things for me that I, I, I find so interesting about um, kind of spoken word theatre, I guess, is is that idea of, uh, and I know, I know Hannah is a, a playwright, you know, outside of the poetic work and stuff, like, but when you're reading, if you are someone who's very used to, accustomed to reading your own work that you know the intention and in, inflection behind, right? The, it must be hard to code switch that and, and be kind of comfortable delivering someone else's words and doing it in their cadence and style and breaking up your your natural rhythms was that a big adjustment to doing that or maybe because you hadn't been in the spoken word scene in so long was it a less hard to break yeah i mean i think there was there was definite challenges definitely but i think as well because we were because obviously we were um you know i was working with patricia um panther and saskia ashdown as well so we had you know i was kind of, it was it was kind of new to me in that sense. Like I've, I'm so used to just, you know, memorizing stuff and then just doing it myself, you know? So I, I had to, you know, you're bouncing off the other women involved as well, because obviously, um, you know, they would say a line and then I say a line and then, you know, so it's, it's just a completely different um, thing altogether. Like, like there are bits um, in the play, which are more, poetic um that in, in the way that I'm used to where you know you get a kind of long piece of um you know words to to say do you know what I mean but it was yeah. um I, I think you know you, you sort of feed off other people's energy and you work out how you you bounce off each other in that sense so it was kind of new but I could kind of bring some of what I knew to it as well kind of thing and I, I think delivering Hannah's work was you know, it resonated so heavily with me because obviously I've grown up in Scotland um, as somebody who isn't white. So it, it read, yeah. you know, it, I, there was never any point I was looking at the work going, oh, I, you know, I don't know what this means kind of thing. You know, I, I knew exactly what she was talking about, which I think made it, um, probably made it easier as well. Absolutely. You know, the, the, having that, I mean, it's why, you know, t topics like that should be, <laughs> should be put together that way right like you, the the cast of that and the team writing it and directing it have an innate understanding of, of issues around you know race in scotland like that's that's gonna i i i, I could always imagine you know obviously that they would make the performers more comfortable having someone that like f has first-hand experience of those same issues running the show yeah definitely definitely and i i think that's so important and you know, it's, it, you know, being able to sort of, um, I think me and uh, Hannah, um, Patricia, Saskia, and um, Beldina, who did the music as well, Heir of the Cursed, you know, I think we just formed such a beautiful bond because we all we all know what it's like to grow up in Scotland and not be, um, you know, not be white. And so it just, um, you know, we were all sort of, you know, talking about our experiences, like, oh, yeah, I've experienced that one as well. Yeah, oh, we had that. Yeah, oh, my God. So, you know, so it's like we, um, I think we were able to form a really, really beautiful kind of sisterhood where we'd all, um, you know, we all knew, we all knew each other so well. And I, I think it, like, you know, understood each other's experiences so well and what we wanted to, you know, how we could channel that energy into the, into the play. It's, it's nice as well to have that, I think, 
I, I don't know if you found, but often spoken word can be a fairly lo- lonely endeavor after a while, you know, kind of constantly creating your own work that is, you know, obviously there's a community, right? There's, there's people you feed stuff, you know, to, to get critique or feedback or ideas or whatever, but like you're inherently usually by yourself. Uh, it must be nice to, to kind of step out of that briefly and, and, and have a more shared experience where the whole pressure of a thing isn't kind of solely on you. Uh, yeah. I think it's important for, for spoken word poets or, or people who are, you know, trying to perform like, uh, get that performance, uh, poetry kind of, style uh, to their work to do that to work with other people because you don't develop proper timing and and kind of rhythm i think until you have to play off someone else (laughs) oh yeah definitely definitely like i had no idea how hard it was to just like make something look natural like (laughs) you know have someone say a line and then you know i always felt like i was like missing a beat before I'd reply because I was having to like think of what it was I was meant to say and like you know it's all those little things like that you just you just have no idea like how hard acting really is like I I would I would just never known that it was actually that cha- to make something look so um natural in that way and you know even just memorizing stuff because you, you it's almost like you have to memorize someone else's lines as well because you have to know when you're coming in like exactly. you have to know what they're saying before you as well so it's like there's so much that goes into it. I was just like, wow, like I felt like I was opening all these other parts of my brain. Have you ever done any like collaborative poetry, like multi-voice poems? No, I haven't. No, no. Because it's a thing I, I, I've I loved doing uh, collab stuff. And like, because obviously uh, Loud Poets are like a, you know, loose collective. It's changed over the years of who's here and stuff. But we've always kind of used collaborative poetry and it's so much fun. And it really, I, I think it stands out because people don't see it a lot like people don't do it often but you can make some uh, amazing pieces i remember really vividly um a guy uh, joe with the glasses uh who's like a, a american poet who was over here uh for a while i think he's back in the states now great guy and um, him and uh, a poet called doug gary another wonderful person long time loud poet he they did a, a collaborative piece um kind of around like because obviously joe being a a a black man from like new york has a particular view you know understanding of the the issues around police brutality in america and stuff and like police violence towards you know people of color and they did this absolutely incredible piece where they were you know kind of playing either side of that role and it was like the but then you can also do it you know hugely comedic you know with with different subject matter because you have that that wordplay and able to bounce off each other and like sometimes a joke works person better if you have a straight guy and a you know a funny guy and stuff like that it'd be something i'd love to see what you could do with collaborative work i think it'd be really interesting yeah definitely you know i have seen um i think i've seen like a quite a lot of american um kind of like poets doing yeah. collaborative stuff i've never seen it actually in um in person either but i bet that'd be amazing definitely I could send. I'll send you through a very dumb, dumb poem about why women should date fat guys that mean Doug did years ago. Uh, to show you how it can be done slightly more tongue in cheek than oh, the American really? slam style. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'd like to see that definitely. Yeah. On that, on when you're looking like uh, stylistically and stuff, um, do do you have like a, a particular preference for for the the poetry you like to hear, like the spoken or 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 read? Like, do you have? Because I found it interesting. I was talking to Rab Florence, who's a comedian. And someone you would, I guess, I would have expected to be into very funny live poetry performances. But he was like, nah, I don't like watching poetry. I like reading it. Like, is there is there a specific format that, that fits you? Uh, not really. Like, I feel like I'm quite um, kind of in the same way I am with music. Like, just quite eclectic taste. Like, I think as, as long as it just sounds good to me, then I think, it, you know, I like it kind of thing. Um, and it could be about any subject matter or... Yeah, just uh, just if it sort of captures something within me or resonates on some level, then um, yeah. But I don't I don't really have any specific uh, like types of poetry that I really like. I think you know because I started writing poetry before having actually seen any <laughs> real poetry. So and then I sort of started looking at um, I think it's like button poetry or something in America. Yeah, yeah. Randomly came across it, and um, yeah, I started watching a lot of like African American poets, 
um, like a lot of female African American poets, um, just you know doing really beautiful poetry, and I was like, oh wow, like that's amazing. Like I didn't know people were actually like doing, you know, and there was sort of crossover and subject matter and stuff. And I was like, oh god, you know, I had no idea. Um, but it just shows you how blind you could be to things if you've not actually, you know, experienced um, experienced them. I've just never known that if that that was actually going on or that poetry was such a big thing all across the world. Like it's massive. I mean, it's it's one of those those big issues I find with with the scene is like people just don't know about it. You know what I mean? Like it's so easy. Like you're you're an amazing example of someone who has you know a, a talent to do something, but didn't know there was an outlet there for it. And as soon as you did wow you know what i mean like a couple of years later you're on a, a such a, a trajectory of like and, and so involved in so many different projects and so varied in in what you're doing and it like i think it's a good thing for this scene does kind of latch on to people who are <laughs> enthusiastic and talented like very quickly is that something you found that like people have been that it's it's been a fairly supportive scene that people kind of pass and you the next thing Oh yeah, definitely. Like it's been so so supportive, and um, yeah, it's just it's just been really lovely, you know. Because I just, you know, like I say, you know, I, I had no idea that this whole scene existed. I'm not a clue. Um, you know, I I'd, I'd actually known Iona Lee. Um, we had like a, a couple of mutual friends, so I knew that she did poetry, but I didn't know that it was like this big kind of thing, yeah. um, or that there was so many opportunities and and stuff out there. I just had no idea and it's you know it really gave me it kind of came along at a really good time because I was just finishing up uni and I was kind of a bit lost I didn't really know what I wanted to do because I'd I, you know I'd left school when I was 15 and just literally just lost about for years <laughs> and you know then I did like an access um to uni course and I, I got um when I was about sort of 21 and I got um you know got into uni and stuff and you know I was kind of like oh my god like I still don't know what I want to do with my life like I've just got not a not a clue at all and so um you know and then it just kind of happened the whole the whole kind of poetry thing and I was like oh you know I'm really enjoying this like it's really guess I'm a poet now <laughs> yeah I suppose. <laughs> so yeah just kind of stumbled stumbled into it um but yeah I, I... I think the good thing is though that, that I think the you know people that are, have been in the scene a long time and stuff realize that and like I, I see much more work going on nowadays to interface with new people and find new people and kind of bring them in like I know that the, that's a big aim behind this podcast and like I know organizations like uh, the the Scottish Bain Writers Network do a huge amount to try and bring you know more voices like Bain voices into the scene and I know you've done a, a lot of work with with them are they a good like starting point if they're you know, being writers sitting watching this, would you advise to kind of get in touch and go through that path? Oh, definitely, because they've got all these great um, writing groups and stuff. I think Hannah runs one of them, and then they do other ones as well, like sort of um, work just different workshops. Which I think, um, I think, it, I think it's maybe by not by donation, but like pay what you can mm-hmm. kind of thing. So, um, you know, I, I think that that's like massively he- helpful for for people and you know and I think as well you know if your poetry does kind of focus on you know the sort of experience of being black or or whatever then you know that's a really kind of good space to be able to share that work or you know see what other people are doing because you know one of the reasons I think as well like because my friends used to say to me years ago like oh you should perform you should go to an open mic night and I was like I would get booed off the stage I was like I'd get eggs I'd get you know I was like there's no way anyone would be up for listening to this you know um this kind of thing and and so you know I, I think I kind of thought that maybe people would be really reactionary to it and kind of just be like oh what is she talking about you know there's no such thing as racism in Scotland and you know that kind of thing like I had all these preconceived notions in my head about what would happen if I ever did decide to do that so I just thought well I'm never gonna do it yeah. kind of thing and you know so I think um you know but actually the scene is actually very welcoming and very um you know supportive and you know there's so many poets who are from different um backgrounds and and stuff so i think uh yeah it's, it's actually a lot more um, it's such a, it's such diverse a horrible, than i thought yeah. it's such a horrible thing to have to consider like you know what i mean like i i that never would pop into my brain obviously and that's like so tragic that that's you know because you see it right there the, i mean i remember the, the guy i brought before right joe he he did like 
I remember speaking to him a lot because I was trying to make sure, you know, we like to make sure that there's a diverse lineup in, in what that means, like in its totality, right? There should be different styles. There should be different, you know, people from different backgrounds of all different sorts, like be it, you know, ethnicity or gender or sexuality or, you know, geography or a million different categories because then you're going to get more diverse poetry, right? You're going to get more, uh, you're going to uh, be able to, uh, hit the, the, the buttons for more people, right? Then th that idea of, oh, you might not like everything on the show, but you'll definitely like something because you want range in all your lineups. And I, I had a big chat with him about, like, trying to, you know, see more, like, BAME poets. And he, like, pointed out there were all these different writing groups and stuff like that, kind of, I think, just as the Scottish BAME Writers Network was getting together. And it was so eye-opening to me that there was this, you know, segregation that I hadn't seen that I was, like, totally you know blind to and it's enti and he explained it entirely based on that idea of like they're not wanting to come and you know go to those shows because they don't feel it's a stage for them the people he knew and I was like that's so terrible and it's nice to see that the I think that has you know even in the time I've been promoting shows there's been like a significant shift to that you're seeing much more diverse lineups yeah definitely definitely and i think you know especially sort of being in somewhere like scotland you know it's not like london where it's just just generally more diverse um you know in terms of demographics but you know in scotland like you're almost guaranteed the audience is going to be majority white like this just yeah, yeah. No way around it that. Is what it is, yeah. yeah totally um you know and so I, I just um you know and i think because of so much like built-in sort of trauma from all the racism that i've experienced the thought of getting on stage and you know telling people about that and just being like oh yeah well you know this is really how i feel about it i think mm -hmm. that that was a really terrifying prospect because it it you know and especially you know this was obviously prior to the whole black lives matter movement becoming you know more accepted within society so you know i you know i i used to try and speak to people even about my own experiences of racism, people would be like, what are you talking about? You know, like, right. like genuinely, what are you talking about? You know, even um, close friends that I had just could not understand it at all. Like, you know, people just thought I was mad if I tried to speak to them about it. You know, obviously I had some really close friends who totally understood, totally appreciated, you know, um, things that I'd experienced and, you know, continue to experience. But I think um, prior I think the, the Black Lives Matter thing has really, it's really helped open um, a lot of people's eyes to how bad racism actually is and how, you know, it's this um, systematic, um, you know, structural thing. And it's, um, you know, it has this very long legacy. And, you know, I think trying to explain that to people before it was just, you know, just went right over their head. You know, a lot of people, they just had no idea. Yeah. So the thought of then getting on the stage was, you know, and saying all this, but I was like, oh, no, never, never. Yeah. There is, there is that thing as well of, you know, the, the, the white people in Scotland like to think white people in Scotland aren't, you know, racist. The, the, oh, no, 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 that doesn't happen here. That's a, an American thing or an English thing or whatever. And you're like, nah, it's a Scottish thing too. Like, it's, it's systems are systems. They're built by the same people. So, yeah, it's... It, it's exactly. it, it's I, I I love so much of your work is fearless about that like you know poems like uh, white woman's tears is that the, the correct title or is it tears of a white woman yeah yeah it, you know poems like that or like uh, emancipation emancipated I'm getting all your titles wrong sorry oh, sorry, sorry <laughs> but like, you know poems like that they're like unapologetically like it was the same thing I brought up with Hannah of like um, when she ends that line the the poem with like you know. Scotland go fuck yourself or whatever the, the end to that poem is and you're like because you do have to be unflinching about it you have to be like to a level confrontational about it because people don't listen when you're not right that's the the horrible issue of it yeah totally like you know I, yeah I don't think people do do listen in that same way or well not you know it's a huge generalization but you know um yeah definitely and I, and I think because you, you can build up so much anger and so much rage you know like you know, I'm I'm like yeah, 27 now, and you know, by when even when I but when I started writing, you know, I'd already had 19 years of like, you know, experiencing like really horrific racism and watching my mom experience horrific racism, and so um, you know, and then a, a lot of the the poetry like sort of emancipate, skin inferiority, denial, those kind of poems that I wrote, they were, you know, I I started to I think when I was about 21, I really started to 
you know, I understood personally the racism that I experienced, but I really started to research into African history, Caribbean history, and um, sort of history of the transatlantic slave trade and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, those poems were really about me trying to process that and understand that because I, I all of a sudden realized that you know it wasn't just that people just don't like black people you know it's this whole legacy you yeah. know behind it and you know as well as my you know my mom's black my dad's white but my mom was adopted by a white family so i didn't we were very cut off from that culture for a, a long time you know until i was a teenager until my mom kind of reconnected with that side of our sort of caribbean heritage and so i was you know completely um removed from that and i didn't really i didn't really understand what it actually meant to be racialized as black like what did that actually mean you know so i had to kind of look back on so many of my experiences and go all oh, right that's why i got in loads of trouble at school but the person you know um who was sat next to me doing exactly the same thing didn't get into so much trouble at school you know all oh, right you know that all, all that unconscious racism which is such a big problem you know I, I had no understanding of that. I just thought people just didn't like me, um, you know, or why I was always picked on in, in school for my hair or whatever, yeah. you know, all that kind of shit. I didn't, I didn't understand it. And so, yeah. Um, so I just rambled on a bit. No, honestly, that, I, I think, I think that that gives a, a huge amount of context to, to your, your work, Courtney, and like the way, you know, you, you stylistically present, like I, I think I was saying before, something I enjoy so much in your work is, the lack of obfuscation of what you're talking about, right? You talk directly about nationalism and colonialism and, and like these these big ideas and you, you, you attack them like directly. You you talk about your subject matter and like from some, you know, explaining what you've explained there of someone who has grown up, you know, being treated in a specific way and, and having no basis to understand why that is that must be so incredibly frustrating and it's all coated in you know it's like you look at the scottish family party and it's like we support families and you have to go no but i know what you mean by that i know what that actually says right and it's when you don't have that it must be so frustrating so i can see why like you know when you get to your poetry that you want to be very direct about what you want to say that makes yeah. total sense yeah that's, definitely. Yeah, that's wonderful <laughs> So I know uh, we, we, I, I, I could talk your ear off all day, uh, and but I want to before we, we we sort of get to um, hearing some of your work. You are currently working on a pamphlet, correct? It's going to be your debut, if, yeah, I, if I'm I not am. mistaken. So, is yes, uh, yes. can you tell us anything about it? Is it going to be new work? Is it stuff that we you know that, that is from your sort of like previous body of work? Yeah, so it's it's kind of a mixture of both. It's mostly. Um, I'm not actually sure how it's split, but it's kind of maybe maybe 50-50 actually, something like that, um, kind of older stuff and then some newer stuff nice. as well. Um, and it's really about, um, yeah, a lot of poems related to sort of race and imperialism, colonialism. And um, yeah, I've got a, a mentor who's kind of helping me with the process um, to, because I got the... Um, what do you call it? The sorry, that's terrible. <laughs> the Ignite Award. <laughs> the Ignite Award, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Through the Scottish Book Trust, and they, um, so they, uh, so I sort of applied, saying, you know, I, I'd like some, you know, help, kind of putting out, you know, either I wasn't sure if I wanted to do a pamphlet or a collection, but I knew I wanted to do something along those lines, and um, so yeah, then I was one of the one of three recipients of the the award, and so um yeah they got me a mentor who's kind of helping me in the process of kind of organizing how that what that's going to look like and um yeah and i suppose it's just a case of sort of approaching uh publishers and stuff so yeah i've actually got my first meeting with my my mentor my first proper meeting with her this week so amazing i mean so it's it's kind of early stages of development when like yeah. th that that's that's such a good opportunity to have that kind of input if you don't have the background in publishing right like it's a jumping into a whole new thing yeah definitely i think that's it's so um yeah it's so helpful because I, I just have no idea kind of where to where to begin with all of that and you know i've yeah. got the i've got the work there um i know all the poems that i want to put in to the the pamphlet i just need to kind of work out how to go about you know the sort of next next stages of that kind of thing <laughs> a lot of fun yeah. uh, <laughs> but that's that's awesome it's, it's good to hear and obviously uh you know if you're 
still in the early stages you won't have dates and stuff but as soon as um, it's put together like let us know and we will obviously do a bunch of sharing let everyone watching know where you can go and, and get uh, Courtney's debut pamphlet exciting stuff oh, well, uh, if people are looking to see more of your work Courtney where can they go find you yes yeah, so um, I'm at Ama Poetica A-M-A-P-O-E T-I-C-A on there's someone that's had to spell that out before <laughs> yeah yeah um and Alma's my middle name as well so it's like I, I know the first part anyway yeah, so, yeah. um but yeah on um Instagram and on uh Twitter amazing amazing so yeah go go and check out all Courtney's work um, and obviously if you have enjoyed this episode of the Loudcast feel free to like and subscribe rate and review follow it and all that jazz and Courtney is going to be sticking about to come and have a chat with us on the Loudcast Extra where she's going to be giving us another poem and we're going to be uh, kind of chatting about that and, and her you know kind of technique of how she's putting it together and kind of get a bit more into the, the technical details maybe we'll see uh, and that's going to be over on our Patreon channel so you can go and check that out uh, we appreciate the support helps us continue to do stuff uh, Courtney to round off the show would you be up for giving us a wee poem yes definitely oh, amazing amazing um I should say this poem is uh is been commissioned by the Edinburgh Inter International Book Festival um for a, a literature festival it's called the Bergen Literature Festival uh, a couple of months ago um so yeah it was a, a fresh a fresh piece written written just a couple months ago oh. um, so yeah i'll just i'll just start shall i amazing yeah yeah um so this is called this is scotland yeah sorry it should say as well the poem was meant to be sort of responding to the ideas of what um how we perceive scotland and um yeah they got other scottish poets involved as well so uh, there's quite i think there's quite a few yeah there were six of us i think um but yeah this is my my poem called this is scotland <clears throat> You forced Scotland down my throat and I no longer want to taste it. Scotland bears no warm embraces, sighing lies seep into blankets of blue and white. They cease to keep me warm. Did they ever keep me warm? Bone broth is not a remedy when crowds of midges swarm and in your grey and overcast your fag butts on the street. Sun and rain, it overlaps, and in some sense you seem complete. But when you say this is Scotland, the words just don't sound clean. Because I see rivers of blue and white clapping hands and football teams. I see feet tripping over discarded bones and rotting wounds disguised as healthy flesh. There's an atlas carved upon my back and I can't put it down to rest. It's etched into my skin, leading me in and out of shadow. The wretched spills in pen and ink what is sanctum, what is hallowed, when it sits inside the vestiges of empire. The voices of imperialism bellow down these drafty corridors lined with Her Majesty's officers. And in this country, there's a certain humiliation that comes with this skin. It sinks into my bones, bitter sleet and icy cold. I isolate my ugly and I burn my palms and my fingertips. In an effort to glean warmth, I bear fire as my only witness. I've had my dignity stripped in this Dun-Eden. I've fought this callous concrete and tough terrain, my earth parched dry and blood stained. I stood dutifully waiting patiently for your rain and storm. And I watched those crowds of midges swarm and I saw through bloodshot eyes and heavy lids how the hungry and the sick pick words from dictionaries and try to make them stick to your raw and bloody flag. Discarded bones and a gracious knack for syntax, all dressed up in blue and white rags. And in this Eden, this Scotland, its histories breed borders and hang crosses upon doors just following orders, Bannockburn battles broadened into Culloden fields. In meshed scents of blood, 
pollen and cullen skink chains of Jamaicans clinked with surnames of Mac, check the maps, head to Dundee, Elgin Town or Aberdeen. Scottish seeds sown between struggling legs in the Caribbean and these splendid merchant cities. New towns embellished with sugar and gold claims to have recognised malfeasance of old, yet still your universities are committing war crimes. As bairns are singing old nursery rhymes, your secrets secrete and creak in musty close to, close for comfort, claustrophobic, too close to the coward slave, and what a man, what a man, Burns tales are told across this land as Melville monuments cast shadows on lies of emancipation. They succinctly state it's just a thing of the past and it doesn't need an explanation, but this is Scotland and this is now Scottish government supporting wars abroad, impoverished people on its own shores, Scotland impaled on its own swords. Scotland was then, Scotland is now, your melting pot of captains, doctors, slave owners and abolitionists entwined, refugees, priests and starving children all somehow aligned on ley lines, some with rebellion in the loins, some seeking oppression of the mind and there are those who hold the keys to your chains and minds, our blood congealed. They conceal revolutions of the working class, how crass they catch our histories in nets. There's an atlas carved upon my back and I can't put it down to rest, not yet, lest we forget. I see history repeating itself cycles of idols and icons burning, we yearning, quenching the thirst for freedom, singing songs of sedition, taking turns, sewing the tapestries of subversion. And though revolution is a bloody, bloody dream for me, I am fortunate enough that I still sleep every night. Thank you. Wow, wow. That's spectacular, Courtney. Oh, Incredible you. stuff. It's, you know, I think I, it was immediately the, the, the stuff you're saying at the start. It's like, I, I get why I didn't like poetry in high school because it was always like the country and it was always very twee and very Scottish. And that was never the Scotland I saw. You know, I grew up in a very like working class new town. Like it was not a, a, a place of glens and fields and stuff. Yeah. And it's like, when I, when I hear people do poetry like that, where it's like the, you know, a good example is like uh, Jim Monaghan's United Colours of Cumnock, uh, which is a poem that always resonates me, with me. It's a much more real uh, version of Scotland. And it's well, like, yeah. uh, I, I find the ability to, to weave both like a passion for a place, like a love for a place, but not a, a blinkered, you know, rose tinted love. Yeah. Like... It, it's, it's so easy to look at those poems and go, oh, criticizing, blah, 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 blah. but like, if you just take a second to scratch the surface, you can see the desperate want for it to be better in all of those yeah. pieces of work. It's, yeah, it's sublime stuff, Courtney, really impressive. Oh, thank you so much. Ah, awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing another piece of Courtney's work over on the Loudcast Extra. Hey, you should come and join me. We're going to be chatting all about that. Courtney, thank you so much for joining me on the Loudcast. I really appreciate it. Guys, go and check out all of Courtney's work and come back in a couple of weeks for another wonderful episode of the Loudcast. Until then, I will say goodbye. Courtney, say goodbye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, we'd appreciate it if you could hit the like button, if you could hit the subscribe button, and make sure to ring that bell icon so you don't miss any updates from us in the future. If you want to go that extra mile and support us a little further, we do have a Patreon channel with loads of exclusive goodies, and you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. We appreciate your help, guys, and hopefully we'll see you again soon.